Very well, we're going to move on now um, to the next presentation. And um, this will be from Professor Michael Marsh, who's here with us. Um, he's the Emeritus Professor of Political Science at Trinity College Dublin. And he is an expert writer in the area of electoral behaviour. And I'm going to ask him to take the podium to um, t t talk to us on three topics, really. Uh, voter turnout, super referendums, and repeat referendums. Thank you very much. It's a, a pleasure to be here. Um, being interested in turnout and referendums, it's great uh, to be able to address a, a large audience that's actually interested in these things. And don't start yawning as soon as you start talking about it. Now, if I can work out how this button works, I'll be fine. Yeah, there we go. Uh, that was my, uh, the list of things I was asked to talk about. Um, the way the world is, of course, uh, that got changed, and I had to talk about some more things. Um, so the original um, uh, six or seven pages I sent round uh, has been added to, and you've got, a, a, I think, a a sort of brief copy of uh, what I'm going to say today, which has the extra bits in. Now, turnout is something that uh, people agonize about with uh, all elections. Are enough people voting? Um, some people used to say when there's not enough people voting, it just means they're quite happy with what's going on. It's not a bad thing. Turnout was enormous uh, running up to the election of Hitler. So was that good or bad? Uh, high turnout tends to mean that, that politics is quite antagonistic and people care a lot about the outcome. When they don't care much about the outcome, when they're arguably happy enough either way, then they don't turn out. Anyway, why is more one person more likely to vote than another? And there are three types of reasons. One uh, has been advanced quite often is that people simply feel they ought to. They have a sense of duty. We all have sense of duties to do all sorts of things, sometimes that we don't want to do, but we sort of do it out of duty. Not coming to talk about referendums, but you know, when, when one is asked, uh, it's a good reason. Um, the second is they care about the outcome, as I mentioned. That's, that's why you vote, because you actually care who wins or what the outcome is. And the third important contextual thing is convenience. Would you go and vote if you had to travel a thousand miles and queue for a day. The first elections in South Africa, people were queuing for hour after hour after hour. If you had to do that here, turnout would be very low, but people really cared, they wanted to vote, they didn't mind. Is the cost of voting high? Little things, can you get on the electoral register easily? Uh, how accessible is the polling station? Is it close, is it a long way? Will I have to wait? What day or days can you vote? And can you vote early? Different countries have different rules about these things. And it has to be said, in some countries, it's a lot easier to vote than in others. Can you vote by post or even by internet? And if so, in what circumstances? We are relatively restricted in these things. Now, why is a person more likely to vote in one election than another? When we look at our elections, we see turnout is higher in some than others. It's higher in some sorts of elections than others. It's lower in local elections than national elections. It's lower again in European elections. So we have European on the elections on the same day as local elections to make sure that people vote in European elections. So we look good for our European neighbors. Um, duty sense probably varies across votes when people are asked. They give different answers to different sorts of elections. Some votes are simply more important than others. Some elections are more important than others. I remember the 2011 election, which many people thought was quite an important election. They, people wanted to say something. They wanted to make sure that those who were seen as responsible for the crisis got their just desserts. I remember my wife went to vote quite early, um, just after seven. And there'd already been somebody in who was emigrating to Canada. But he'd gone in and voted before he went. Now, my guess is he probably didn't vote for the current government, or at least what was then the current government. But it, he clearly cared. Uh, sometimes the campaign is stronger. 
If the campaign is stronger, turnout's higher. All other things being equal. There are lots of variations, but turnout does vary. And convenience varies, uh, probably varies from time to time, and rule changes can affect convenience. But these cost elements tend to be important for people who usually vote. They don't say they vote every time, but they, they think of themselves as voters. People who don't vote, the convenience is not going to make much difference to them. So you can say to someone who's never voted, oh, you can do it by internet. But they've never voted. They still won't want to vote. That's what the evidence suggests. Now, how about information? Uh, there's been a lot of talk about information. Level of information is typically related to turnout. Here's a couple of very simple uh, graphs. Uh, the Lisbon 1 treaty, people were given a four questions about the EU. Did they get all four right or did they get none right? And uh, can we guess how likely they were to vote by how many they got right? And the answer is yes. Those who got none right were pretty unlikely to vote. Those who got all four right were very likely to vote. They were more informed. Probably they were more interested. Probably they cared more. Is that a bad thing? It's probably a bad thing that people have low information, but is it a bad thing that people with no information don't vote? Here's a different scale, Lisbon 2. Instead of uh, objective knowledge, so you ask people questions and they know the answers or they don't, you say to people, well, on a 10-point scale, how much do you know about all this? A lot? 10? Nothing, one, somewhere in between. And again, people who knew more were more likely to vote. And this is the evidence of election after election, referendum across referendum around the world. How much do people actually know? Lots of discussion uh, in the last half hour or so about uh, knowledge and information, but how much do they know? Very simply, a lot less than commentators think they know an awful lot less, um, because most people are not very interested when there's nothing going on. As election day approaches, knowledge goes up because it becomes more important. But for most people, politics is something that they're not very interested in, and they'd probably go out of their way to avoid getting information. I remember Brendan Howland saying to me at a, a Rupters committee when I was talking about the appalling job people had made informing people about Nice or Lisbon or one of those things. And he said, well, I tried. I knocked on the door. But when people don't want to hear what you've got to say, what do you do? How much do people need to know? And there's a lot of discussion in the literature, psychology, political science and other about this. And one argument is people need to know enough to make the decision they'd make if they knew a lot, a lot more. So if you knew everything, you'd do X. So how much do you need to know to pick X? You don't need to know everything. Maybe there are a few pointers you could pick up, and that would get you there. And those who were very positive, I suppose, about elections tend to say most people know enough to make the decision they'd make if they were fully informed. And others are a bit more skeptical about that. The sort of shortcut that people might use is, do they know who's making a particular argument and do they trust them? Okay, I, I think so-and-so is very trustworthy. I think they've done a great job. I like what they've done. If they say, vote for Nice, that's good enough for me. I'll, I'll do that. I heard a vox pop with someone in the Falls Road, uh, I think before the Brexit referendum, and he was asked what he was going to do, and he said, I don't really know anything about this, but David Cameron's for it. That's enough for me. I'm against it. <laughs> no one told him, I think, that Jerry Adams was uh, against it. But anyway, enough to link the decision to people they trust or sometimes don't trust or to relatively strong underlying opinions and values. So it, it's argued in, the Nether in Denmark, which I think is a better case than Ireland, people know more about Europe and they feel more strongly about Europe. So when a referendum comes up, which is about single currencies or uh, particular treaties, they have a set of opinions and attitudes that are reasonably stable that they can link that to. If a, if a referendum comes up that 
you can't link to things that you know you've got views on. It's a bit harder to know where you stand. A very cautionary tale about a low information vote. Uh, we did a study after the Oroctus Inquiries referendum. Uh, the study was done three or four weeks afterwards. But um, around half of the people we spoke to couldn't tell us who argued yes, couldn't tell us who argued no, couldn't give us any arguments for a no, couldn't give us any arguments for a yes, couldn't explain why they voted yes, and couldn't explain why they voted no. Now, that took place at the same time as a presidential election. I think many people had perhaps didn't realize there was a referendum going on at all. But it's a cautionary tale if we're going to decide what we do by referendums that so many people arrive there with such uh, unformed opinions. Now, the Irish referendum experience, and I'll do this fairly quickly, uh, turnout. There's turnout in elections. It's gone down. At least we think it's gone down. But as an Oroctus committee pointed out a year or so ago, nobody believes the electoral register anyway. So we have to take turnout figures with a bit of a pinch of salt. Maybe they used to be very good, but we now know they're not. There's uh, referendums where there's just one referendum at once. Uh, I put the names of those referendums on. I realize if you're very clear-sighted and sitting in the front row, you might be able to see those. Otherwise, you won't, but they're on the bits of paper you've got. But basically, they're all the blue ones are the one referendum at a time referendums. The purple ones are the two or three referendums at a time. I was asked to talk about these. Did it make any difference to turnout? Well, there's turnout in elections. We know that referendum turnout tends to be lower. There's the turnout, the blue line, when there's only one referendum, and the pink line, when there's more than one. Now, I've excluded cases where there's a general election or a presidential election at the same time. Um, but certainly, it doesn't make a strong case that if we have Three referendums will get a higher turnout than if we only have one. Some of them are very close. Are they close when there's high turnout or low turnout? Neither. Uh, we've had close ones with low turnout. We've had close ones with relatively high turnout. But we've certainly had quite a few referendums where a little bit extra turnout might well have made a difference uh, one way or another. Uh, Shannon abolition, um, abortion, I think in 2001, cabinet confidentiality, doing away with the electoral system, though that was quite a high one in, in uh, 1969, I think, and divorce in uh, 96. Generally, there's lower turnout in referendums than in elections. Duty is lower, perception by voters that these things are important. And campaigns are less vibrant. Uh, parties, particularly activists, are much less involved. It's interesting that the pattern of turnout is very different. Uh, particularly the western rural areas have very turnout in elections and poor turnout in referendums. Places like Dunleary tend to come top of the list when it comes to referendums, but not when it comes to elections. Their turnout is about the same in both, but a lot more variation elsewhere. Do multiple elections help turnout? There's no evidence that they do, and if anything, um, uh, no, they don't. But when you have two elections on the same day, do, do people distinguish them to referendums? Uh, yes, they do. Uh, again, I'm afraid apart from those in the front row, you can't see which ones those are, but where two dots are joined by uh, a dashed line, that shows the difference between the yes vote in two on the same day. The first two points there have no dots. And if you're really right at the front, you might see that those labels are a bit more blurry than the other labels. And the reason they're a bit more blurry is the dots, there are two dots and they're in marginally different places. But essentially, the first time two questions were asked in the first two times uh, that happened, people gave exactly the same answer to both of them. Uh, 
The first time, arguably, it was all about changing the electoral system, and that made sense. The second time, it was about um, religious recognition of different religions in the Constitution and voting at 18, two things that seem to have nothing whatever to do with one another. But if people said yes to one, they appeared to say yes to the other. Uh, but now there's quite a lot of discrimination, and uh, people can, as they did on same-sex marriage, say same-sex marriage, good, yes, President's age 18, no. We also have repeat referendums. Uh, views vary about how many of those we've had. Nice, certainly that was, most people would say, a repeat referendum. And Lisbon, I think divorce was a repeat referendum. It was essentially the same question twice. Um, some people might think we've had a lot of referendums on abortion, but you might say they're all so different. Uh, they're not repeat referendums. What happens? Well, in three of them, uh, the yes vote went up and the turnout went up. So the first one, uh, I don't know whether I have a little dot on this. No, no, I don't. Anyway, the first one uh, on the left-hand side, Nice 1 to Nice 2. The second one in the middle, Lisbon 1 to Lisbon 2. Turnout went up, yes went up. Uh, the next, but two across, divorce, divorce. Turnout marginally up. Yes vote, well up. The only one that went down were Fianna Fáil's attempt the second time to get people to change the electoral system to guarantee them office in perpetuity. And, um, and people said a bigger no the second time than they said the first time. And we haven't had that one again uh, yet. So repeat referendum. Some people think they're terrible. We shouldn't have them. As somebody said, look what happens when we vote no, they make us vote again, which I think is the, the feeling. But maybe that's okay if there's a gap, but how big should the gap should be? And in both Nice and referendums, there were differences the second time round, which some people might see as cosmetic and some people might see as rather more important. Uh, what would the response be if turnout was lower and the decision was reversed? Uh, that might be more problematic, but in, we haven't had that because it's always gone up. On the, on the other hand, uh, there were changes, as I've suggested. It's arguable that information levels were much higher the second time round. People are free to vote differently. It's not a big cost, they just have to turn up and vote again. Uh, turnout went up, so clearly people weren't too upset by having to go out again. Uh, the electorate endorsed it, and it happens elsewhere. Uh, Denmark had two votes on Maastricht. Quebec has had more than one on independence. Uh, there were many votes all over the world on prohibition. So, make your choice. Experience from elsewhere. Um, multiple referendums. There, there are not many countries that have held a lot of constitutional change referendums on the same day. The, the best example is Australia, and they haven't done it this century. But they did used to ask people to vote on many items, um, sometimes severally, and once with five questions on the ballot. More commonly, and Theresa Reedy will talk about this later, um, there are countries where a lot of things on the ballot are citizens' initiatives, so they're put on, as uh, I think one of the questions uh, indicated earlier. Uh, they're put on by 50,000 or 100,000 citizens. They're not necessarily constitutional, um, but sometimes they are, but typically they're more policy ones. Italy, Switzerland, most US states, but not the US at federal level, allow these initiatives, and they're very common at local level. And typically where they do happen, you have a lot at once. Oregon once had 28 at once. So you turn up for an election, to vote for the president and the local rat catcher and everything else that you vote for at the same time, and you've got 27, 28 initiatives to vote on. So elections are interesting there. Um, some illustrative Swiss votes, I don't want to dwell on this, but if you want to know what sort of things do they vote on, it should be on your, your printout. Um, uh, road tunnels, uh, unfair taxes on married couples, get rid of foreigners who commit crime, even if the EU doesn't let you do it, um, whatever. 
California, another place uh, with initiatives, um, had 17 in 2016 when they turned out to vote for Hillary, which they did. Uh, turnout's quite high in California, much higher than in many others. Um, but there were 17s, and they go from uh, bonds for education to death penalty procedures to um, requiring the use of condoms in por pornographic films. You know, you name it, it's somewhere on the ballot paper. Um, the star one was legalization of marijuana. That passed, and almost everybody, almost everybody who voted in the election voted in that one. On the death penalty procedures, 1.2 million less. So having turned out, they still didn't vote on that one. But you know, the drop-off was not small. California tends to be quite small, but in some other states, you can see it go up to 15 or 20 percent, or even more. Fewer people voting on, uh, on the initiative than vote in an election. Now, what does all this experience tell us? Uh, People make different decisions on different items, as they do in Ireland. Some initiatives pass, some fail. Turnout's variable. Uh, the Swiss, I've seen good Swiss analysis to show it relates to the salience of the item, which is now earth shattering. The more important it is, the more people vote. The US shows that sometimes initiatives actually increase turnout, at least in years when there's no president to be elected, when turnout tends to be pathetically low. Um, but typically, as I said, we see fewer voting on these than on more prominent ballot items, sometimes a lot less. Uh, outside the US, on the whole, when people vote on one, they tend to vote on all of them. Uh, not, not much difference, but of course, if you've got to vote on 18 of them, you might get a bit tired before you get to the end. There's also good evidence from Switzerland where turnout tends to be lower, that uh, if turnout was higher, you'd have had a different result. Or if information was more widespread, you'd have a different result. These sorts of estimations are relatively technical, but I think quite sensible. And uh, it's interesting that so many changes would take place with more information or more information. Not always in the same direction, not in terms of more liberal or less liberal, more right or less right, uh, just differences. Turnout matters then. Um, what measures would help turnout? One of the questions I was asked to talk about, and I think I've about 10 minutes left. One is to make voting more convenient. And I could spend an hour on this. Um, so I'll just spend a minute. Uh, there are lots of ways to do that. Um, you give people two days to vote instead of one. There are lots of countries that do that. You vote at weekends. The evidence is absolutely clear that countries that vote at weekends have higher turnout than countries that don't. That's not to say, of course, if you move to a weekend, that turnout would then go up. But it is the case that it's higher where people vote at weekends than not. We're very unusual, actually, being a Catholic country that doesn't vote on Sundays. Um, I don't know why that is. Some one of these historians at the back will probably tell me, but um, either because we were worried about the small population of Protestants that there were at Independence, or because uh, um, we were just used to voting in the weeks, because that's what they'd done in the UK. So I don't know. but. We're free to do what we want now. If we want to vote on Sundays, we can vote on Sundays. Most of Europe votes on Sundays. European elections, we vote on our European elections, and we can't count them until Sunday, because everybody else is voting. Almost everybody else is voting on Sunday. However, these sorts of facilitation things will just make it easier for the people to vote to vote. It won't necessarily increase turnout. Lots of experiments or analysis of this in the US tends to say it'll only affect three, four, maybe five percent. It's not going to suddenly push up turnout by 20 percent. All those young people that don't vote are not suddenly going to turn out and vote, even if you allow voting by internet, which some people do, and it doesn't make much difference to turnout. Everybody in Estonia votes by internet. The second thing is persuade people with enough information that the vote is important. Of course, it might not be important, so it's very difficult to persuade them of that. But 
a permanent electoral commission. Um, I think that's a, it's a no-brainer. Other people have that. Um, one that's actually set up before the campaign takes place. Earth-shattering. Uh, the last few governments, Oroctas, uh, all party committees, everybody said we need a permanent electoral commission to do referendums and elections, like they have in proper countries. And the government says, yes, yes, and nothing <laughs> happens. Why nothing happens? I don't know. Um, suspicious fingers have been pointed at certain people in the Department of the Environment that resist it, but anything more would probably be libelous. So anyway. Um, it's important to have vibrant campaigns from parties and citizens groups. And I do think citizens groups are important. Parties, parties are not good news at the moment. It's very good that they get out and campaign, but you want citizens groups getting out and campaigning too. But you can't force people to take in information. And it's hard to force campaigns. Campaigns are expensive. It would help if there were more funding. And some countries provide public funding to a yes campaign and a no campaign. That would be pretty earth shattering. We've never done that. Why don't we do that? Well, usually because the people who would have to make the decision support one side and not the other. They don't really want to give a lot of money to the other side. But arguably, we'd have better campaigns. If you could find someone to spend the money on some of those, it might be difficult. But uh, I'm sure someone would make the effort. It's no good, I think, to rely on neutral, unsourced arguments. And this was the big flaw when we had people prancing around our screen before Nice saying, oh, well, I think we should vote no because of something or other. And then the actor on the other side says, oh, no, we should vote yes because... And the point was, we didn't know who these people were. but well, we did. They're just actors. We don't know anything about them. We don't know who they are. We don't know who's making those arguments. So we don't know what to trust. Much better if we know the people making the arguments and, uh, and then we can decide who we should trust. The uh, simple solution, of course, is compulsory voting. They did that in Australia and Belgium. They did it in other places, but they've given up. Uh, it addresses the symptom, not the problem. It gets everybody out there. But they don't necessarily know anything when they get there. So you ensure that the decision is made by more people who don't know anything <laughs> Uh, than less. If you want to get turnout up, give people a reason to vote, and finding them is not a good reason. Should we have super referendum days? Uh, it would raise turnout? Bigger event in the media? We could certainly get through all the things that people like you suggest we should have referendums on. It would reduce the financial cost of referendums. We did lots at once. You only have to hire the school on one day. Uh, if you had it on Sunday, you wouldn't have to close the school as well. Um, and there is evidence that people discriminate. However, there's no evidence that having lots of votes at once increases turnout. Um, the fear is that there'd be more items that people knew nothing about. They'd be hidden by some of the more prominent items. It's hard to see who'd run big campaigns on some of those items. And even the media, which has got all our best interests at heart, as we know, is likely to highlight one or two that will keep people tuned in rather than the ones that will get them to turn off. Another possibility is a referendum in which people choose between several options rather than between change and the status quo. Some people call those preferendums. Now, that really is an earth-shattering thing. Um, the multi-option referendum experience. They tried that in Sweden on nuclear power. So they gave people three options and, uh, and people voted for the one they liked best. It was quite close between <laughs> two and three. It was non-binding so the government effectively went for one. But But it was quite close. Um, and arguably, one and two were, were closely related. It would have been a bit of a disaster if three had won, because three was very different to one and two. Um, 
New Zealand uh, changed their electoral system. Uh, they had a consultative referendum with two questions. Do you want to keep the electoral system or change it? And then the second question was, what do you want to change it to? And there were four options. And there was lots of information, so people voted. And, uh, and, they pick, and more people picked one system than, uh, than, uh, than any other particular system. The next year, they had a binding referendum with two options. Do you want the old system, or do you want the new system that most people liked last year? And they went for the change. Australia, this tells you how, what one, I mean, it took about importance. They, they needed not a new national anthem, I think that may be the wrong word, but um, some Australian will disabuse me, but they wanted a new national song, you know, for cricket matches and stuff. Um, voters had four choices, and the winner was chosen, not by the one with the most votes, but by the system that the Australians used to elect members of their assemblies, which, surprisingly enough, is more or less the same system we use. So Advance Australia Fair won 43% of first preferences against God Save the Queen, which got 18.8. And when the votes were redistributed, presumably waltzing Matilda was eliminated. I don't know why they didn't pick that one. Um, <laughs> And if that didn't do the trick, then the Song of Australia got it through. Now, one might say, um, here's, here's an example of how well the system works. I might say, how could they pick Advance Australia Fair over Walsing Matilda? I don't know, but there you go. Advantages and disadvantages of these. Um, an Oireachtas All Party Committee considered this. Um, they said it was too complicated for you, really. You wouldn't understand it. Um, referendums are on complex issues. Preferendums introduce even more complexity, they said. There's the possibility of confusion. A simple majority system could easily lead to results which a majority oppose strongly. I'd certainly agree with that. Um, an all-party report said it was impossible to devise a satisfactory method of weighting voting preferences. Presumably the system that elected them was no good. <laughs> or the system they use for Eurovision Song Contests. There's, there's something nobody knows anything about. Um, <laughs> that was too complicated. At a referendum, there's a majority one way or another. A preferendum might result in an option which did not obtain the support of the majority. No, not if you used a PR system. How would the set of proposals be decided? That's probably a bit more difficult. They worried about finding a majority one, splitting it up so that it no longer got a majority. But again, that only really applies if the one with the most votes wins, as opposed to... Um, a more proportional system. Four, we could say, uh, we don't need many options, just a reasonable choice. Let's say three rather than effectively the two that we always have at the moment. Maybe sometimes four, but we don't need 27 options. And the Australians did manage to pick between four songs. Different groups could campaign for different options and would no doubt say, and if we don't win, then pass it on to option three. Concerns about weak majorities just don't apply if you use PR, which is probably not too complicated for the Irish voter. A majority for a single question simply means a preference over that alternative. It doesn't remove the possibilities. And it removes the need to try and identify an option that it's believed commands majority support. And if you want an illustration of that, um, the discussion over the next referendum on abortion is a classic. Probably most people want to see a change. They want to find something that a majority will agree with, but they're not quite sure what that is. Well, if you could have two or three options, 
instead of just the one, it might be easier to find out what the people actually would consider supporting. In summary, then, uh, turnout's lower in referendums than elections. Sometimes it's very low. Sometimes that makes a big difference. There are no simple ways to increase it, but there are lots of ways in which we might push it up a little bit. We could make voting easier and improve campaigns. In Sweden, most people have voted before an election comes along, by post. If you change your mind, then you send in another one, and they delete the first one. It's not rocket science. Holding multiple referendums does work, I think. It doesn't do much for turnout, and some items almost certainly get overshadowed. Repeating referendums upset some, but voters seem to respond positively. I think the evidence is that voters don't mind. Multi-option referendums, I think, are worth looking at seriously uh, using PR. Thank you.